Um, we shall have uh, strange maps, strange new maps between graphs. So here's a usual map, which is a symmetry of the graph D4. So here you can map one edge into some other edge and uh, uh, something like this. Yes, so this is a, a, an isomorphism of graphs, right? And instead of this, we'll have what I will call uh, Q maps, as in quantum maps. And they are also, uh, I'm going to call them also uh, connections. between the graphs, we generalize these, while at the same time, for the graphs AD, there are only a finite number of them, so they remain discrete. Uh, in particular, in the lesson today, we'll study the maps from the graph AN, which I'm going to draw now. So this is a graph AN. Here it's A5 as an example and going into the graph D4. Now, there are certainly no classic uh, homomorphisms uh, of this kind. What we need here, so this is our graph G1, and this is our graph G2. A lot of things are going to work in general. And uh, what's needed is that uh, the norm of the adjacency matrix of G1 is equal to the norm of the adjacency matrix of G2, or which is equivalent that the Coxeter number of G1 is equal to the Coxeter number of G2, given that this is the uh, is quantum two at the nth root of unity. So this is two times cosine of pi over n. So in this case, both of them have n equals six. And as we saw in some uh, previous lectures, these numbers measure the asymptotic growth, asymptotic growth of the number of paths by length. So as you grow the length by one, the number of paths asymptotically grows by this factor. So since we're going to map paths into paths, it will result that these two numbers are the same. So here is the data for this. There are some auxiliary graphs, so I'm going to build the actual ones that appear. So the data for such a connection is some auxiliary graphs. Okay, I'm going to lift them a little bit. Certainly we can. Uh, oh, the, the boards are too dark, you think. Yes, uh, that we can uh, check.
That's all we can do. Is the, are the lights for the camera all right? Yeah, looks, fine. looks fine. So maybe, Arthur, maybe you can come a little bit closer. So. And this is, by the way, a remake for the record. This is a remake of a lesson which, which uh, was lost because of a technical glitch. So, now we have, uh, we're going to write the Peron Frobenius eigenvector here, which is 1 root 3, 2 root 3 and 1, this being quantum 1, quantum 2, quantum 3, quantum 4, and quantum 5 at the respective root of unity. Yes, and the corresponding Peron from Ilya Saigon vector here, 1, 1, 1, root 3. And by the way, uh, you can notice, okay, so we're going to uh, discuss the data. So the data are some auxiliary graphs drawn here in yellow, the horizontal graphs. And some map W, which goes from cells. Cells are plaquettes. Of this form into a number which is also will also be denoted by the cell itself. And this is a number in C. Yes, because the computer is a bit in the way, certainly. And now, this is a continuation of the definition. So it's a model in plaquettes. And the requirement will be the following, that if we fix two opposite vertices, in that case, there's a set of paths of this kind and a set of paths of this other kind And the map that goes between the two, which if we choose these paths as a basis, this is a matrix. The requirement is that this matrix be be a unitary times a scalar And this scalar in this case is exactly square root of the product of these, these are the Peron Frobenius eigenvector numbers, which are exactly the ones written there. And we also require that these, that when these are fixed, that this should also be a unitary times 
a scalar. So this is called, uh, this I call the bi-unitary connection. These were introduced by me a few decades ago. And uh, today we'll see a uh, way in which such a bi-unitary connection really uh, works. In particular, the bi-unitary connection between the graph AN and any other graph. Now, uh, this particular case is important first because this connection is unique and canonical, as you'll see, under, under natural circumstances, and because it contains actually the whole uh, usual quiver theory and it leads to all of the representation of algebras uh, of, of Lie algebras of type uh, of, for simple Lie groups, and it will lead further to, uh, uh, to the generalization of these to uh, the higher case. So this case is fundamental. Now, I must mention one more thing here, which is the gauge this is also part of the definition. The gauge, which is, uh, for mathematicians, this is a freedom of choice. Under which two uh, such connections are considered the same. Yes, and this freedom of choice is that whenever you have K edges, there is a unitary UK, a unitary U in UK, may multiply these edges and it, it would change accordingly the cells. So uh, the cells which have these, these edges at the top would be multiplied by respective coefficients. And uh, one should also, so this is, uh, this gauge appear, uh, applies to the yellow graph, to the connection graph. So think of the, the edges of the yellow graph as vectors, which they are, in a certain basis of uh, intertwiners, of homomorphisms. Uh, the number of edges indicates the, dimensions, the dimension of that space. That space has a natural inner product, uh, each edge uh, has size one, and so these represent an orthonormal basis. And so this change of gauge is simply the change of basis in these, in these maps. So this is a gauge, and uh, we should also mention here, it's in a small corner, but it's uh, absolutely essential, the definition of an in-decomposable connection of this kind, which means not a direct sum up to gauge what this means is that if you use these unitaries to change bases your connection may separate into two connections and let's say with uh, horizontal edges colored yellow and red so that the cells are non-zero only if the edges have the same color. Now that is a decomposable connection. And an indecomposable connection is a connection which up to gauge, so even changing the gauge uh, is never decomposable, is never a direct sum. Yes, so it's very easy to see that uh, connections 
separate this way into uh, into uh, in the composable ones and since we have also the gauge we can uh, write them as a direct sum of irreducibles with multiplicities as usual in the presentation theory so uh, one observation here which we should make is that the, gra the horizontal graphs have also an eigenvalue as well. And it's interesting to see what's this. So if we, if we scale these, scale by multiplying them um, with a number, maybe somebody can figure it out here. Uh, this graph becomes, this becomes an eigenvector for the horizontal graph. So I happen to know this if we scale it by root 2, so that we get uh, the numbers are root 6, uh, root 2, root 2, root 2. Then you can see that the horizontal graph has norm root 6 because the sum of this of the neighbors of this uh, point it will be root 6 yes the sum for instance of the neighbors of this point where the value is root 6 will be 1 plus 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 so that would be 6 which is root 6 times 6 yes both graphs have the same norm which is root 6. So that is a norm of the connection that we're looking at. So the norm of this connection is root 6. Very good. So this is the preliminary. This is a definition of the connection. And now comes the theorem, which is for any AD graph G with coxeter number N and any vertex A of G there is a unique connection between a n minus 1, the graph a n minus 1, and G such that the vertex zero of A N minus one, this is the first vertex. is linked to A once, which means that you have here that this is a vertex zero. This is 
a n minus one, which has, by the way, the Coxeter number of this is n. So this is these are the vertices zero, one, two, three, and so on. And this one should be connected to the graph. Uh, let's put here a more interesting one. This is E7. Yes, yeah, so if you have your, gra your vertex A, so that there is a line from 0 to A. So starting from this line from 0 to A, we can complete complete uniquely to a biunitary connection of course up to gauge This would, this theorem would allow us to make computation with paths. And let me remind you here the basic computation, which is fundamental in statistical mechanics. So this is a basic computation. with cells or plaquettes, as they are called by statistical mechanics. So remember, these are numbers in squares. And the main computation is the following. You have a rectangle paths forming the boundary of a rectangle. And the computation is to map this into a number, which is W of this uh, frame, actually. Uh, notice that this generalizes exactly our definition of plaquettes. So uh, it's a kind of big plaquette. And this, this number in C, this is defined as the sum of all internal choices And the internal choices you see are here edges and vertices of the product of uh, all cells of uh, all the cell. Remember that this was this number was in C. So we subdivide this picture into cells, and we let them move around. So you can imagine that they fluctuate while keeping the boundary fixed. They are in a 
the edges take values in a configuration space of edges. So there are choices of edges Here, this configuration it means the same thing as an ambient space. And this ambient space is here the graph AN, the graph uh, DN, and some uh, horizontal graphs. So this is the ambient space. And you can imagine that uh, the frame is fixed while the center of the rectangle moves around in this ambient space. And of course, uh, be the boundary being fixed, it has more freedom in the middle and so on. So this computation uh, increases quite a bit in complexity as, uh, as the rectangle grows. We should also mention here, for the physicists, a connection, this, in, this uh, product is very much like uh, an integral in quantum field theory. where this is the exponential of the action, this would be the Lagrangian. So the exponential of an integral, which uh, was chosen around the time of Euler as uh, the letter S, standing for the sum, yes? So this continuous sum the exponential of this continuous sum is replaced here by, uh, by a continuous product of cells. And after that, we have to integrate uh, everything. Uh, usually, a big problem is a measure which we use in integration, and that's the uh, interest of having here discrete configuration space, finite, that these sums are finite. But nevertheless, they behave like the integral of the exponential of the action. Uh, it will be very interesting to find asymptotics for such integrals as we make the cell smaller as we take the usual thermodynamic limit. So, however, in this case, they will give very fundamental things related to graph. And it's not an exaggeration to say that the whole representation theory as uh, written by Hermann Weil of uh, simple E groups is contained exactly in this biunitary map from the graph AN to every vertex, as we'll start to show next time. Yes. Well, uh, they certainly do. I mean, you have to normalize these things, and the normalization, first of all, is a bit uh, 
uh, arbitrary. So certainly, yes, because uh, that, that's a way, I think, in which you normalize them, to, to get one as a baseline and then study others, especially as you move the boundary. Now, the, speci the very special thing in these computations, which we are just now starting, but which will be the crucial part of uh, next Friday and next week, the crucial part is that in an unexpected way, just when you think that uh, these computations would give uh, some big sum that you can uh, uh, evaluate asymptotically and so on uh, uh, as found by physicists, just at that point the mathematics comes straight on and what you get is zero one after you compute some uh, giant square. And moreover, that will be interpreted uh, geometrically as uh, flatness, uh, as Riemannian connection on graphs. So we'll sh show that finite graphs, although they are very finite, they have a Riemannian geometry with parallel transport, exactly like in general relativity theory. And the parallel transport, as you can imagine, is done exactly by these coefficients in, uh, in uh, big rectangles. Because as you can see, if you look very carefully at that rectangle, it can be interpreted as moving the left-hand path, the vertical path, to the right-hand path along the horizontal ones. So that will be exactly the kind of power transport that we'll use. The remarkable thing here is that for the maps from AN into a graph G is that uh, this connection is unique once we give the vertex V. What this means if you already know some representation theory, the graph AN is a graph of tensoring with a generator for the representations of SL2. At the root of unity, it stops. That's why this is a finite graph AN and not the half infinite line. So these graphs, so the image, the numbers, the multiplicities that we get can be interpreted as fusion tables of a quantum subgroup by tensoring with uh, irreducibles of uh, the graph AN. They appear, they had appeared as fusion tables, those numbers, in uh, papers by physicists uh, like Vincent Pasquier in the 19, early 1980s. So now, uh, let's proceed to the proof. In order to see the proof, it's, I have made, uh, to see it better, I have made a, uh, a mathematic, uh, program which illustrates it. We'll try to see what one of these scenes is, okay. So uh, here is a connection. And what we're going to do is make a kind of dictionary. So instead of this connection, we're going to go to a Cartesian product between the two graphs. You can see the graph number two here, the graph D4 unfolding into such a Cartesian product. Moreover, due to the nature of the parity in this case, this Cartesian product is taken over Z mod 2, so it's taken even with even and odd with odds. 
So you can see here that the graph D4 appears many times. We're going to give a formal definition in a minute. And what we do next is replace this horizontal graph. Look, the mul look at the multiplicities here, the one, one, one of the edges. Yes, so now that information will be replaced by numbers, which as you see are one, 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 and two in the middle. One, 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 one. Now, um, when you work with a cell, remember that such a cell Remember that such a cell uh, looked like this. It had an edge here and an edge here. And here K edges and here L possible edges. So it's quite natural to encode these into a matrix which is K by L. So let's make it. So this is K by L. And the whole uh, nature of biunitarity is that when we fix these two vertices, we get a unitary. And when we fix the other two vertices, we also get a unitary up to a scalar. So this means that this block of matrices is part of two unitaries, dep depending on which of the two we choose. So this is illustrated here with a bit of programming by having the fragments of unitaries arrange themselves into unitaries, as you can see here. This is what we discussed last time noting, of course, the analogy with the, with the uh, dancers of samba, which also change formations. So we have to fill these uh, fragments of unitaries with unitaries. And uh, let me write, however, formally a definition before that, because it's good to work with concrete definitions. I'm going to write it here. So we change encoding. It's almost like changing to a different language and these things are fairly fundamental, so they can be encoded in very different ways. So the encoding here is instead of having uh, an AN graph going into, so here A5 into D, D4. So this is a graph A into G. This kind of uh, encoding only works for the graphs AN. We're going to get here the graph G product, Cartesian product with A. Let, let's put A on this side. A product with G over Z mod 2. That's, again, because the graphs are bipartite and there's a parity. And in this case, this picture is like this. Uh, 
and uh, the yellow edges, whenever we'll have, for instance, two yellow edges from, so the vertices here will be pairs B, N, K, and B. K is in zero up to N minus two which are the vertices of A, N, A, N minus one, and B is in the vert is a vertex of G with the same parity. So now whenever we have two edges from the graph, uh, from the vertex K to B, we're going to write here a number two instead. So these numbers encode connect the connecting graph multiplicities. It's a multiplicity of the graph leading to it. Uh, no, this is this just happens here to be like this, one to each. So the numbers are going to be one, 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 two, one, 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 and one, just in this particular case. Uh, the bigger such number can appear in the graph E8 and is a number six. And it will be an important graph, in an important number in representation theory. So, and by the way, this uh, film lesson shows the great advantages of having an unlimited amount of time for a given topic. Which we shall assume because uh, this is a makeup. Now, here is such a bionitary cell. I mean, a group of bionitary cells which have two vertices which are fixed. Yes? And uh, let us look what happens when we unfold them. Again, for every horizontal line, we have another copy of the vertex. So you can see that the vertex, that the connection, the half of it becomes the blue one, yes? It goes first on the graph AN, so you go from the magenta vertex to the two neighbors, up and down, right? Followed by edges horizontally. The red graph, so this was a blue graph. You see, you go to the two neighbors and you move horizontally. The red graph proceeds from these two vertices to the neighbors on the other graph, on the graph G. Yes, first, and then go back to the other side. Now, this is supposed to be a unitary. This is a bi-unitary connection. The unitary matrix is a square matrix. So this is why, if you look here, the sum of the three, of the three red, of the three blue vertices here, just a second. The sum of the three blue vertices is the same, one plus one plus one is the same as one plus two here. Yes, these two. Because these were exactly the, the uh, red and the blue part of the uh, 
of uh, the connection. So let me uh, show you, I think this was uh, meant to be seen like this. And as you can see here, if you put here on 11, this, so the sum of these two numbers is exactly the sum of the horizontal ones. And these we called by harmonicity. The Laplacian, the horizontal Laplacian acts the same way as a vertical Laplacian. Yes, sum of neighbors vertically is a sum of neighbors horizontally for these numbers. Yes, notice that this is the same here. One plus one is equal to this two. Yes, for the point which is not here. Right, so that comes from another choice. Very good, so now we start building that by unitary connection. And you see that something very strange happens. Uh, we'll start it. You don't need to see this. So we started from the very top. Do you see we arrange them at the very top? So this is right near the edge from zero to A. Uh, let me let you look a little bit at that. So this is for the, for the edge from one to eight, do you see from here, between these two, you have exactly how many unitaries? One. Yes, you have one path this way and one path the other way, right? So this is a one by one unitary, but you have freedom of choice gauge, which is one U1 for every yellow edge. So it means that you can multiply this number by an arbitrary scalar both on the horizontal and on the vertical. Yes, and so we can choose this number. Let's choose it. We can use that gauge to choose it one. Yes, there are similar numbers in the other two. So again, the freedom of choice here is by multiplying with one scalar from the left, all three, and then multiplying each of them with a scalar. Yes, now we rearrange them. We go to the next unitary, which is like this. Now you can see already that something is happening because, uh, because the, uh, this top vector has arrived correctly normalized. Remember that it was supposed to be a unitary times square root of these two numbers. These are the two corners, three to the one half and three to the one half. So it means that the, the unitary is scaled by three to the one half, which is exactly the length of this vector. Yes? So we have chosen this vector in the previous step without knowing to have length square root of three, yes? Now, look at what we have next. The, we have to fill this, you see, and the gauge that we have, the freedom of choice that we have is exactly this number which is here in blue, which is U2. So we have to complete this one vector which has a correct length, by other two. Now, if you have one vector and you choose other two, the freedom of choice for the other two to make a, an orthonormal basis is exactly U2, regardless how the first vector, where you are, how the first vector was chosen. So this is, so, so the choice will be unique. And let's make the choice here. So this is, uh, these are some numbers which are perpendicular to the first one and perpendicular to each other. Yes? And they will have norm, if, as you see, this is root 6 over 2, negative root 6 over 2, it's perpendicular to the top. So their norm will be again square root of 3. Yes? So up to this point, we have completed one unitary. 
and the three small unitaries, yes? And now we continue, we look at the next one and we move them again and they reassemble themselves. Now look again, something strange happens. Although there are pieces of the previous unitary, the length of these vectors is exactly what it should be, square root of two times one. Yes, so the length of this vector is square root of two. As you see, the squares of this is two plus six over four, which is two. Yes, so, so are the others. So now the freedom of choice is u1 for each of them, but that's exactly completing one vector to a basis of two. And the freedom there is exactly u1, and we have the freedom of choice u1. So this means that the next step for this step as well, the completion is unique. So this is what we do now. And uh, here comes a case, I mean, as you progress, again, you, you put this like this, and you see that here, almost by a miracle, the, sa the length of these vectors is, is exactly root three, as it should be, and they're perpendicular to each other. Now, the miracle comes from the fact that these are pieces which come from different unitaries, as you see. And moreover, the inner product here, be the, the product of these two numbers is zero, here is non-zero. However, the sum of these products is zero. So what this shows, is that the completion of, this, uh, of these uh, bi-unitaries, the completion of each unitary, depends on the whole past. That is the interesting part. And once you see that, once you see that the completion depends on the whole path, you can Figure out the proof. The proof should make use of all the previous choices. And if you uh, lift the screen, and you look carefully on the blackboard, seems to have a will of its own. If you look carefully, there is one computation which depends on all the cells. And that is exactly the statistical mechanical sum. So that shows that our proof should be exactly of the statistical mechanical sum type. And uh, this proof is very visual what you do is exactly a zipper. So you build a zipper out of these biunitary cells, namely, so again, we are at the proof of that theorem, so the proof, besides the remarks that we already made, what we're going to do is look at a n, we go here up to the vertex k. Let me use the colors that I used before. And this was a vertex a. So this left one will be the graph a n. This will be the graph a again. And in the middle, the graph will be our graph g, which is here d4. And 
what you can see is that since this uh, is a unique edge, you can just as well think that you're summing after it. So there's a unique edge, remember, from the vertex zero to the vertex A. Yes, that makes a, this graph irreducible. That is, state, that is in the statement of the theorem, yes? So if you have a unique thing, you can view it as a sum over that unique thing, which has only one thing happening. So we're going to represent this sum graphically by this cap. So this means sum of a, a chronic symbol of the two edges, of one edge with the other edge, after they have been flipped. Yes? And let me mention at this point something which uh, we have forgotten uh, just uh, a few seconds ago, that uh, a few minutes ago, which was that uh, that uh, the cells are chessboard conjugated. That is, that every other one, for every other cell, we take a complex conjugate. That way, the gauge, gauge is UK, U here in UK. And from below, it's U star, which is U transpose conjugate, and they cancel. So the gauge in the middle of a statistical mechanical computation cancels. It's just a product of unitaries. Uh, the only place where the gauge would, would have any effect is, uh, is on the edge, and there the effect is minimal. Now, our assumption was that, uh, so our construction was making the first ones, uh, each of them a unitary. So if we sum over these edges, and as we uh, as these two edges are the same, so this is the edge uh, zero one. So this is the same here as here. These two edges, and certainly the one in the middle is the same. When we sum, we'll have uh, some uh, unitaries, and our sum will reduce to this, the chronic symbol of what's left. With a chronic symbol here, because if these two are not the same, then the you have a product of unitaries, a product of u, u star is the identity. And uh, so this, this would give you zero when you try to match one side with the other. Yes, so again, you have here the sum of chronic symbol of the two. Once again, this, uh, this cap should be viewed as a, uh, as a chronic symbol doing exactly what it shows. And so this continues this way.
up to the end and now you can interpret this exactly as showing that uh, that the result that what you're going to get this way if you sum these two edges is exactly a Kronecker symbol, so the last two are really uh, parts of a unitary, yes? And then the, the proof uh, proceeds exactly as stated. It's a piece of a unitary, the front part, the top part of a unitary. Uh, the vectors are orthonormal. I haven't shown here, so I leave as an exercise to show that the norm is correct, as you can imagine, that would make sure that would make use of the of the Laplacian of the sum of neighbors on the graphs. And the fact that this is the same. So once you arrive at this point, it means that you have constructed up to every point the first rows of a unitary. Then uh, you complete them in a canonical way. If you have a piece of an orthonormal basis, there's a unique way to, to uh, complete it up to a choice UK up to the gauge, uh, which is exactly the gauge that we have, yes? So we complete, complete up to gauge. And that is just uh, the end of the proof. So this shows that the graph AN maps uniquely into any other graph, and we shall end with one definition, namely, if we have the graph AN now, we take any number of vertices of it, and we take exactly this unique connection up to A, this is A in the vertices of G, and we take below a B in the vertices of G. And so this should be the, the, gra the vertex zero of AN, and these should continue in principle up to, I mean further, this is a graph AN, yes? And uh, in this case, we get a path here, so the map will be now the following, zero up to k, maps. So this would be for every edge E, connecting edge E. We map this into the sum of this thing, which is a number. Times this edge from A to B. And uh, So the sum of all the vertical paths, A to B, and this is, this is a number in C, and this is a linear combination of paths. And this we call the essential path from A to B in that Cartesian product. And the multiplicity, if we have here multiplicity two, it means that we have two essential paths. So these are linear combination of paths. And they have the property, which you can see as an exercise, that if you apply a contraction between any two consecutive levels, this contraction will give you zero. That's because 
uh, you're going to use uh, the biunitarity of the connection, so you're going to take an inner product between two rows of a unitary, between two vectors in the basis. So, right. Yes, so this uh, property would be essential, and uh, that's, uh, that's what we're going to do next time. That would be the lesson for today. If, if there are any questions, yes. no. so you can see once again here that uh, that uh, the proof that these vectors were unit were were a piece of a unitary that they were. Uh, normal to, they were perpendicular to each other, this proof used the whole previous construction exactly by the statistical mechanical sum. Thank you. So thank you.